Um, I, I was uh, wanting to carry over more uh, Williams today. Uh, poor Williams, he, he only got a day like, like uh, Langston Hughes, but it, it's hard to give everybody their day. Um, uh, and I'd, I think, on reflection, I'd, I'd rather uh, give two full lectures to Marianne Moore, because uh, first of all, she's a difficult poet. Uh, oh, good, you're saying, <laughs> as opposed to all these other people. Uh, she's, uh, she's difficult in a different way. Uh, and uh, in some ways, she doesn't seem difficult uh, as, you, as you get started, but she's, she's idiosyncratic. Um, and um, I'd like to uh, give her uh, uh, a chance to um, get your attention and um, uh, give you a chance to learn how to read her. Uh, it also strikes me that we haven't read a lot of women poets in this course, ha have we? Uh, we've read H.D., uh, but that's really about it so far. Um, the uh, giants of modern poetry, they're men. Uh, Yeats, Eliot, uh, and company. Um, uh <coughs> Moore has a claim to stature uh, like theirs. Uh, I think she is uh, um, a remarkable poet. Um, and one who, interestingly, I think has had as much or perhaps even more um, practical influence um, and effect uh, over the development of poetry since uh, modernism uh, is much or more than any of the poets we've been reading. Uh, the general question of um, uh, the position of women and of women poets in modern poetry is interesting and important and important context for thinking about more. Uh, women in the uh, uh, modernist literary culture that we've been uh, studying are um, identified very frequently with uh, popular and genteel forms of writing and taste. Think about Hart Crane complaining uh, to Harriet Mon Monroe, the editor of Poetry Magazine, as if she's just too square to, to get it. Uh, this is, this is uh, not an unusual attitude. <coughs> uh, women are associated to a degree with political writing uh, of the period, certain kinds of experimental writing, uh, and also, uh, above all, with the, with the legacy of the 19th century poetess. Uh, James Joyce said, the wasteland ended the idea of poetry for ladies. <laughs> this is its achievement. <laughs> uh, poor ladies. Uh, well, um, I, I, you maybe get the idea um, uh, in Joyce's comment that uh, here was a, a poem that uh, broke with uh, a 19th century culture of poetry uh, that was, in certain ways, feminized, uh, at least as uh, imagined uh, here by uh, Joyce and certainly by other modern poets. Um, at the same time, um, you can think about the very rich and complicated role of women in uh, the wasteland uh, in order to uh, get some sense of the complexity of the position of, of women in modern poetry uh, in general. You think of the um, ways in which Eliot, as a poet, draws on female speakers and female voices uh, and, you might say, even aspires uh, to sound like um, Isolde uh, or uh, Philomel uh, or, um, well, one of his own uh, inventions in the Fire Sermon. In general, uh, you could say that the modern poets we've been reading uh, aggressively and self-consciously uh, uh, masculinize poetry, <coughs> in particular by trying to dis disassociate uh, poetry from what is commercial, uh, polite, uh, soft, dreamy, uh, ideal, leisured, uh, all qualities and attitudes gendered in their imagination. <coughs> Uh, and instead, to connect poetry to what is 
technically rigorous, advanced, learned, unsentimental, uh, uh, hard, uh, and often hard work. <coughs> Uh, terms that are again clearly gendered. Uh, HD, in her own uh, distinctive way, is also doing this, taking part in this. Uh, modern poetry wanted to make poetry culturally central and powerful, uh, to reposition it, to uh, achieve for it uh, the power to define and describe culture. And this was very often, as I'm suggesting, uh, played out. Uh, in very gendered terms, uh, trying to uh, claim for poetry um, a kind of um, uh, set of uh, capacities that were um, uh, strongly gendered in these poets' imaginations. Uh, at the same time, this desire, as I'm saying, is conflicted and complicated, and we need only think of Eliot's case, but you could look back to uh, Yeats's relationship to women speakers, uh, his own complicated uh, set of uh, identifications with them, uh, and so on. Uh, how does Marianne Moore fit in this? Uh, what did it mean for her to be a modern poet and a woman? <coughs> uh, these are, are, are questions that um, I'll take up today, uh, first of all, addressing this question specifically of, of uh, well, what did it mean to write from the position of a woman for Moore? And, I, and, and then I, I want to go on and talk about Moore um, as a, an American poet, uh, which she was self-consciously, uh, and then uh, to uh, begin to talk about Moore as a nature poet, uh, which she also was. Uh, let's let's get started by uh, looking at um, well uh, one of her uh, earliest uh, publications, a poem that, uh, like uh, many of the other important early poems by these poets, appeared in Poetry Magazine. Uh, this time, I think in 1919. I'm not sure. I'll I'll check the date. I, I'm talking about the poem called "A Grave" uh, on page 440. It's a great poem, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a poem that announces a speaker that sounds like no one else, uh, and sounds like, certainly, uh, no one we have been reading. Um, think about uh, The Seafarer, another poem <laughs> about the sea. How did that sound? Bitter breast cares have I abided. Uh, nigh in the night, uh, you remember Pound's uh, sonorous and uh, even perhaps ponderous, uh, heroic uh, Anglo-Saxon alliterative uh, meter, which I talked about as, in Pound's case, a deliberate and interesting evasion of iambic pentameter norms, uh, blank verse as a kind of uh, model for heroic speech. Well, so is this, but it sounds nothing like that. It's on the other end of the spectrum, right? It sounds like what? Prose, in certain ways. Uh, a remarkable, elevated prose, but prose. Prose that uses words like consciousness or volition, however. When was the last, po uh, last time you saw a poem that said, however? Uh, it's, uh, it really uh, announces a, a, a speaker who is using a kind of expository language. <coughs> uh, there are Latinate words. Uh, uh, there's obviously no meter and rhyme. <coughs> uh, at the same time, uh, there is a uh, developed and, as almost always in more intricate formal design and idiosyncratic formal design <laughs> that is operating in the poem, but almost secretly. Um, what's it look like on the page? A lot of long lines, right? Um, <coughs> a lot of long lines, some of which run over. Well, uh, this, like other Moore poems, uh, is a poem structured around counting syllables per line. Uh, and counting, in fact, number of lines. This is not a kind of uh, formal organization that you hear 
and it's even difficult to see. But it's an operative one for her, and it's one of the ways in which she organizes her verse. Uh, it's as if you know Moore has, in some sense, set up her own rules, clung to them, and kept them secret. <laughs> she doesn't always keep them secret. Sometimes they're quite conspicuous and and and. Uh, uh, even uh, you know flashy in certain poems and their designs, but here it's quite inconspicuous. What you have is a poem that is made up of two eleven-line groups, uh, two eleven-line stanzas or paragraphs, each beginning with a short seven-syllable line: "Man looking into the sea, for their bones have not lasted." This is a, a kind of uh, pattern that structures the poem. Uh, in all these ways that I'm, I'm describing, the, the syllable count, the uh, expository writing, the uh, Latinate uh, diction, the uh, self-conscious pro uh, prose-like nature of the uh, uh, language, all those semicolons, uh, this is uh, poetry that has distanced itself from um, traditions of song. Uh, and certainly from 19th century uh, traditions of uh, versification. Um, the form of the poem is, is, again, not something you see or even hear necessarily. It's there, uh, almost as a kind of absence. Now, there's also, uh, wonderfully, a certain combativeness. Moore <laughs> is a combative and pugnacious poet. Uh, you, uh, again, may not see this immediately uh, because of the poem's impersonality, uh, in the way in which it, it seems to present itself, and um, uh, the often intricate um, uh, forms of, of syntax and, 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 uh, or oblique approach. But she is a fighter, uh, and this poem is really uh, 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 a kind of uh, fighting uh, that we're, we're seeing. <coughs> uh, the poem begins in irritation. It begins as a complaint, a complaint that's addressed to whom? To man, man looking into the sea. Uh, man suggests, well, maybe humankind. Uh, you think about the people on the shore in Frost's poem, neither out far nor in deep, <laughs> who are standing there looking out at the, at the water. Uh, well, um, uh, Moore might be addressing them, uh, but <coughs> I think there's uh, a more specific and particular uh, man uh, that is the uh, um, uh, irritant that sets the poem going. Uh, uh, a man, a figure of a man who, like a romantic poet, has arrogated to himself the position to, you know, take in the view, you know, stand like uh, the figure in a Caspar David Friedrich painting and, uh, you know, uh, gaze into the sublime. <coughs> uh, meanwhile, Moore is somewhere else. <coughs> uh, where is she? Well, uh, she's somewhere behind him. Uh, because he's blocked her view. <coughs> Man looking into the sea, taking the view from those who have as much right to it as you have to yourself. Well, it is human nature to stand in the middle of a thing, she says, uh, trying to uh, uh, make sense of this. Um, Moore uh, has uh, a, a couple comments here that, that uh, describe the origins of this poem. Uh, it's on the first uh, quotation on your handout. She says, uh, as for a grave, uh, it has a significance apart from the literal origin. But here's the literal origin. Uh, it was a man who placed himself between my mother and me and the surf we were watching from the middle ledge of rocks on Monhegan Island after the storm. Don't be annoyed, my mother said. It is human nature to stand in the middle of a thing. Uh, it is, uh, you know, important that, however, Moore was annoyed. She was annoyed into poetry, you could say, uh, and she took her mother with her. <coughs> uh, you know, uh, the poem is, is really written from the perspective of a daughter and mother, uh, and a, a daughter with an intimate relationship to her mother who um, uh, absorbs here and very often elsewhere in her poetry. Uh, 
actual uh, quotations from, but even more importantly, uh, a style of speech and attitude uh, associated with her mother, who uh, talks a lot like Dr. Samuel Johnson or, or some other uh, 18th century uh, 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 figure and moralist <coughs> like that. Uh, Mrs. Moore uh, is someone that Mary Ann uh, uh, always identified uh, with herself. <coughs> um, it's significant here that Moore is using a quotation from her mother and not acknowledging it uh, in any particular way, uh, as if the two women had you know, one voice and one perspective. Uh, the man that blocks their point of view uh, and you know, blocks their point of view, you could say, in many senses, their you know, literal point of view of the water, but also uh, in the point of view he takes, uh, in effect, ignores and suppresses theirs. <coughs> uh, he is standing in the posture, uh, as I suggest, of a uh, kind of conventional romantic visionary uh, staring into the sea, emblem of infinity. Uh, well, it might be Hart Crane, right? Uh, uh, writing at Melville's tomb, <coughs> uh, although Crane wouldn't write that poem for a few more years. Uh, and, and when he did, incidentally, he sent it to Marianne Moore, who was then the uh, editor of The Dial, who sent it back and rejected it. <coughs> um, uh, Moore's uh, poem uh, is, uh, in fact, as I suggested, an early poem of hers and an early act of self-definition. Uh, that's quite uh, important uh, in, in both the impersonality of the point of view and yet the uh, insistent um, uh, individuality of that, that point of view. Um, <coughs> Moore's poems are like this. They seem impersonal and yet they're at the same time deeply uh, personal and deeply um, uh, individual. Uh, here she celebrates the power of the sea to resist the imposition of the observer's will, uh, or uh, the will of the sailor, uh, or seafarer. Uh, uh, you know, again, we can think of uh, Odysseus or Pound Seafarer. <coughs> uh, you know, the, the sea is, uh, well, the sea is, uh, uh, the sea is a collector, quick to return a rapacious look, i.e., if you want to, uh, take possession of the sea in some way, well, don't think you can do that because this is a grander force than you and it will take you up uh, and drown you, uh, which is what uh, the poem um, uh, goes on to describe. <coughs> uh, the sea has here the force that it does uh, in uh, other uh, great poems by Moore, like The Fish or Sojourn in the Whale. It seems to stand for death. Uh, it is uh, a grave. Uh, it is a grave in which you could say uh, a certain idea of romantic and I think specifically male subjectivity is overcome and buried, shown its limits. Uh, in this poem, the human uh, uh, imagined finally as something that twists and turns in the depths uh, is converted by natural forces uh, into a part of the natural world that it's sought through the man's perspective to dominate. Uh, Moore sent this poem uh, to Pound. These poets are always sending their poems to Pound. <coughs> uh, he responded uh, with admiration in that second quotation there. He says, thank God, even though you are a woman, I think you can be trusted not to pour out a flood in the manner of dear Amy Lowell and Edgar Lee Masters, who, though not a woman, was a uh, sentimental regionalist <coughs> uh, and, and not, you know, uh, an international modernist. <coughs> uh, Pound is, you know, approving of Moore here. Uh, he he uh, approves that she does not gush, uh, she, she does not emote. Uh, she has not written a sentimental poem. In fact, in certain ways, she's written an anti-sentimental poem. Um, I think it's important that uh, Moore's uh, rhetorical choices have prevented her from doing so, uh, that the poem has the kind of formal self-discipline 
it does. Uh, again, these are, these are uh, aspects of, of uh, restraint uh, in the poetry. Moore is dry uh, in all respects. Uh, at the same time, uh, these, are, these are modernist values, uh, you know, uh, values uh, that, that Pound would describe in his Imagist Manifesto and elsewhere. Um, at the same time, uh, Moore gets her dryness not by disavowing femininity uh, or suppressing it or, or attacking it uh, as one of uh, her peers might have. Uh, she does it rather specifically in this act of challenging man. Uh, let me look with you at the letter that um, Moore wrote to um, Pound uh, uh, in response um, that um, um, acts as a kind of now letter of, of introduction. Uh, and it has a lot of interesting things in it, and it's probably a good introduction to who she is for us, too. Uh, she says, uh, um, I was born in 1887 and brought up in the home of my grandfather, a clergyman of the Presbyterian Church. She comes from a Christian and God-fearing home. Uh, I am Irish by descent. That's part of where some of the combativeness comes from. Possibly Scotch also, but purely Celtic. Uh, was graduated from Bryn Mawr, where she knew and befriended H.D. Uh, taught shorthand, typewriting. Uh, she's worked for a living. <coughs> uh, in 1916, my mother, Mary Warner Moore, and I left uh, home in uh, Carlisle to be with uh, her brother a chaplain uh, of the battleship Rhode Island. There's, there's a lot of uh, Christianity in the family. <coughs> uh, she says uh, and she's living with her mother in New York, and indeed she would spend the rest of her life living with her mother in New York, in Greenwich Village, and in Brooklyn, in a small apartment. Contrary to your impression, I am altogether blonde and have red hair. Uh, Pound had asked, uh, uh, whether she was Ethiopian after he read the poem Black Earth. <coughs> <laughs> read Black Earth and think, decide whether, whether Marianne Moore is an Ethiopian. <coughs> uh, this is important. She says, any verse that I have written has been an arrangement of stanzas, each stanza being an exact duplicate of every other stanza. This is not always true, but she claims it is. I have occasionally been at pains to make an arrangement of lines and rhymes that I like repeat itself. But the form of the original stanza of anything I have written has been a matter of expediency, hit upon as being approximately suitable to the subject matter. The resemblance of my progress to your beginnings is an accident. I, didn't, I wasn't influenced by you, Pound, when I started writing syllabic verse, because Pound had experimented with this himself. <coughs> Uh, th there's, there's a couple ideas here that are uh, important. Um, uh, first of all, that um, Moore identifies, as it were, two moments of creativity uh, involved in the making of her poems. One is a moment of spontaneity and expediency in which lines almost like some kind of, um, uh, you know, channeled speech uh, arrive in a certain form. And then she makes that form, in its contingency and accidentalness, uh, repeat itself. Uh, she goes on and, uh, in other words, what uh, came by chance, she repeats through will, uh, through discipline. Um, this is uh, significant, uh, and, and it's related to uh, a kind of um, uh, well, to her originality of form, uh, which is something at once, something uh, that, as it were, comes to her naturally and that she um, uh, builds on self-consciously and through um, a kind of rigorous self-discipline. She says then, I do not appear. <laughs> uh, she meant, I don't appear in literary periodicals. You can't find my poems anywhere. 
Uh, but there's a, um, but the line itself is wonderfully suggestive and simple. The uh, the sentence I do not appear, uh, and in fact, uh, Moore does not appear very much in her poems. Um, she is interestingly um, uh, backgrounded or uh, even invisible uh, in her poems uh, in the ways that she is in a grave. Um, and then she says, I grow less and less desirous of being published, produce less, and have a strong feeling for letting alone what little I do produce. Uh, and uh, then she uh, continues, <coughs> To capitalize the first word of every line is rather slavish, <laughs> as they do in 19th century poetry. <coughs> and I have substituted small letters for capitals in the enclosed versions of the two poems that you have. This is, this is another sort of distinctive formal choice Moore makes, not to capitalize her uh, first lines, uh, something Williams uh, does too. <coughs> uh, in a graveyard, she now goes on, now talking about the poem, uh, A Grave. A grave's better than a graveyard, don't you think? Uh, the change that I have made is to the end of the line, the very end of the poem, uh, uh, as you suggest, and for the sake of symmetry, uh, I've altered the arrangement of lines in the preceding stanzas. I realize that by writing consciousness and volition, this is, th this is the order of the words that Pound had proposed at the end of that poem. Emphasis, emphasis is obtained, which is sacrificed by retaining the order which I have. That is, Moore's order, volition, and then consciousness. And I am willing to make the change, though I prefer the original order, which, in fact, ultimately she kept. Uh, let's look at the end of the poem again. <coughs> Uh, the sea looks, uh, uh, well, uh, I'll read from line 20. Pound said, well, that ending dis doesn't quite do it. Why don't you switch consciousness and volition? Uh, with what implication? Uh, that, to, uh, that, that somehow volition is more important than consciousness, uh, that it's the last thing to go uh, and the most uh, dramatic uh, thing to lose. Uh, Moore, however, insists, no, that's not the case. It's the other way around. Consciousness is more important than volition. In fact, that's really what this whole poem is about, you could say. Uh, Pound uh, wanted the emphasis, to uh, uh, take Moore's word, uh, that comes with stressing volition as most important. And in fact, volition is nothing but a kind of expression of emphasis. Uh, she says, no, consciousness is more important. And as she does, she emphasizes it. <laughs> uh, she introduces another kind of emphasis, one associated not specifically uh, with volition so much as uh, the uh, drama and power of consciousness, which she insists on here. Um, <coughs> Although Moore's uh, uh, poem could be, in fact, read as, as a kind of uh, uh, rebuke in advance to Hart Crane in uh, his poem, uh, At Melville's Tomb, uh, Moore, in fact, uh, got to know and like Crane in the 20s, uh, sometimes acting as his editor uh, when he sent poems to the Dial for publication. She turned back at Melville's tomb. She accepted other poems. One poem she accepted, The Wine Menagerie, uh, was a poem uh, in um, uh, quatrains. Uh, she accepted it and then converted the poem into free verse uh, and reduced it by half its size. <coughs> Crane accepted it, uh, uh, accepted this publication along with ten dollars, <coughs> uh, which he needed. Uh, but both, uh, uh, both um, Crane and Moore, uh, like Williams, uh, were, uh, I think, self-consciously American poets, uh, and their Americanness uh, is important to how they define themselves as modern poets. Uh, and there is really in all of them a certain kind of combative cultural nationalism, uh, which has uh, aesthetic uh, and, and uh, uh, ethical um, um, 
implications. Uh, as an example, uh, let's turn a page back and look at the poem England. <coughs> uh, okay. Um, the poem begins here as a, a series of national caricatures. Uh, and then uh, eventually uh, uh, it will um, move from these caricatures, uh, which suggest ways of life and also aesthetic dispositions, ways of doing and thinking about art, I think. She'll move from that to talk about America uh, and uh, what is American. Uh, and uh, this is, you could say, her, her real subject here. <laughs> and then she will go on and, and describe uh, uh, America. Uh, she will go on and contrast everything that she has just caricatured uh, in, a, in a polite but essentially negative way in each of those cases with, uh, with the American, uh, and specifically um, with American speech uh, and uh, American English. In other words, just because Americans who say Sam or Cam uh, sound like that instead of Psalm or Calm, that doesn't mean they're stupid or that the rest of America is. In other words, if you don't think you can get poetry in America, you haven't looked. It's a wonderful poem. It's a defense of America uh, and uh, American creativity, uh, American language. Uh, it is uh, an attack on Eurocentric cultural snobs. <coughs> uh, uh, at the same time, uh, Moore is not only or merely adding America as one among other nations. Rather, uh, America is the locality where this principle of hers is honored, uh, a place that incorporates many other places, uh, many other cultures, uh, many other ways of uh, feeling and thinking and speaking. Um, this principle, the idea that inspiration has never been confined to one locality, to one place, uh, affirms a kind of art uh, that is not only a matter of high culture, but that is also vernacular, uh, regional, heterogeneous, popular, and includes in it all kinds of materials. And you remember uh, the quotation I uh, uh, pointed to in the first day of class when I, I quoted from uh, Moore's poem, Poetry, and she was talking about all the things that should go in poetry, and even uh, uh, business documents and school books. Well, America is a, a, a place where you can put those things in poems. Uh, this is, this is a, a, a proud, uh, also a comical uh, principle. It's a democratic principle for Moore. Uh, is it maybe also a feminist one? Uh, I think so, uh, insofar as Moore defines what is American uh, as specifically uh, and distinctively uh, a non-hierarchical point of view. Uh, that is uh, not so much uh, a woman's point of view, uh, so much as a, a point of view that accommodates uh, that of the woman uh, among others within a multiplicity of human perspectives, and in fact, non-human perspectives. Uh, she's serious about including those cats and dogs. <coughs> uh, why is the poem called England? Uh, by incorporating uh, the, the title into the first line of the poem, poem Moore makes it seem accidental. Uh, the, di uh, the device uh, foregrounds uh, Moore's concision and practicality. Why waste any extra words on the title? Uh, Pound wants you to use no word that does not contribute to the presentation. Okay, uh, then uh, we'll make the title part of the presentation too. Uh, the gesture is also uh, of a piece, I think, with Moore's distrust of hierarchy itself. Uh, she says, in effect, the title is not uh, uh, more important than the rest of the poem. It doesn't stand outside it or above it. Uh, it's just part of it. Uh, just as Moore found it slavish uh, and probably pretentious to capitalize the first word of every line of verse, 
Uh, she wants uh, to, uh, in that sense, give dignity to the lower case, to, to non-capital letters. Uh, at the same time, Moore is very wily and clever. Uh, England really is important here. Uh, that is, it's not merely the first nation in an arbitrarily arranged list. Uh, she's defending America and American English uh, specifically against the noted superiority of England and English literature, uh, where, of course, Pound, Eliot, Frost, and others had gone to establish themselves as poets. Uh, and, and to this extent, she's saying that the, the title is uh, uh, not so important that uh, it stands uh, above the poem. England is not so important uh, that it stands over and above America. Uh, and, and in this sense, the title, in fact, turns out to be important and to give us important information uh, because she's out here to make England less important uh, and to deny it its pride of place. Well, uh, we've got just a, a few minutes left to start um, a long, uh, difficult, uh, and truly marvelous poem called An Octopus that uh, exemplifies Moore as a nature poet um, and exemplifies uh, many of the uh, distinctive features of her writing. Uh, again, uh, this is on 441. Um, <coughs> the uh, title of the poem is the first line. Uh, we might think that uh, this is going to be a poem about an octopus. Uh, well, not exactly. Uh, in effect, the, the uh, uh, title is a, is a kind of riddle that the uh, poem will uh, go on and explain and expand on. It's a poem about Mount Rainier. Uh, Mount Rainier, where, where Moore went uh, with her brother John in 1922, that same year that uh, Joyce published Ulysses and, and uh, Eliot ended the idea of poetry for ladies <coughs> in the wasteland. Uh, the poem involves a kind of uh, essential contradiction which it works through uh, in complex ways. On the one hand, the mountain that um, Moore calls an octopus that she's writing about here uh, is something that is exactly other. It's outside the poet. It's, it's out there like the sea in, in uh, a grave. Uh, it's objectified. It's something Moore has to stand apart from, perhaps try to conquer in the form of climbing it or conquer in the form of representing it in her writing. And yet in the course of the poem, the um, mountain and its glacier, which is really the octopus that she's talking about, um, uh, is something that Moore identifies herself with uh, that uh, comes to look like Moore in certain ways. Uh, it comes to be identified with uh, the force of her art. So it's both a kind of version of herself and it's a version of something other, too. Um, the poem is filled with an extraordinary and bewildering detail that evokes the natural world as uh, one of uh, uh, extraordinary and bewildering detail. Um, at the same time, it combines and creates uh, a fantastic collage of quotation from a wild variety of sources. Um, it's hard to know where to start and stop in this poem, <coughs> what its parts are. Uh, it's uh, a question that, in, in a sense, Moore is asking about the mountain itself. <coughs> um, there's, in general, a kind of analogy uh, throughout uh, the poem uh, between the mountain and the woman who admires it, uh, whose mind itself can seem octopus-like and reaches out in these long uh, tentacle-like lines to grasp the world, make it her own, uh, freeze it in poetic language. 
uh, even while she's insisting on the, the, the wonderful otherness of the world. Um, I won't, I won't um, uh, uh, start reading now at the end of class, but let me say a couple uh, further things about the poem and ask you to uh, reread it uh, and, um, uh, and to um, knowing that it's hard, um, reread it uh, more than once and maybe not continuously. It's a very hard poem to read continuously. Uh, be sure to read the last paragraph of it carefully that begins on 444. Um, <coughs> let me say something before we stop about quotation. Uh, you remember uh, that the sea in a grave uh, mocked uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, rapacious collector. <laughs> uh, Moore herself was a great collector. Uh, she collected, among other things, quotations. Uh, she engrosses them. She uh, uh, gathers them to her. Uh, she uh, um, uh, you know, masters uh, uh, her reading. <coughs> Uh, she brings them into this poem uh, in, as I say, a kind of uh, collage. Uh, it gives the poem a kind of, um, well, a very strange polyvocality. There's many, many voices here. Uh, think of the wasteland. Well, more, more rivals it in this poem. Uh, many voices that, again, democratically allow for, you could say, multiple perspectives, uh, multiple kinds of material. Uh, unlike the wasteland, uh, uh, Moore is not um, quoting uh, only high art sources by and large. Well, Eliot has his popular culture uh, too, but we, we know that it's, uh, it's pretty much a high culture poem. Well, Moore is making her poem out of magazines, out of uh, a a pamphlet from the National Parks portfolio uh, through her reading in Ruskin uh, and uh, many other sources. <coughs> uh, and it treats those various texts, uh, you could say, non hierarchically, without a kind of regard to generic valuations. She doesn't play off high and low as Eliot does in a game of chess, for example. Uh, it makes the sources of poetic language and of poetry continuous with ordinary life, uh, her activities of reading, uh, and at the same time, it makes uh, Moore's inspiration deeply personal. Uh, because who else but Marianne Moore would have read all this stuff uh, or just these things? Um, <coughs> like Pound, uh, a kind of visionary scholar uh, who, who found his, his uh, muse in a, in a translated Homer, uh, Moore, uh, knowing that, that, that literary inspiration is not confined to any locality, finds it all over the place in her reading. Uh, but again, what she's reading is something different from Eliot and Pound, and I'll say more about that next time.